Okay. Over to you, Chris. All right, you want me to share screen? Yes, please. All right. Yep, that's working. Good, okay. Now all I've got to do is to get rid of the sign that says this meeting is being recorded. To presume I press continue and it's gone. Right, well, good evening, everybody. Thank you very much for, for having me. Um, although my son lives in Wickford, um, I'm actually in York, so um, it's um, uh, somewhere that I've not been able to visit for quite a while now. Um, but I'm, I'm grateful for this opportunity to talk to you all, not about a steam locomotive or anything like that, but about a railway coach, which is the one that hopefully you can see in front of you on the screen now. Um, the Old Gentleman Saloon, um, as David and I were discussing earlier, um, the Old Gentleman Saloon from the Railway Children film in 1970, which was filmed on the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway. And that's where it's normally based. That's where that photograph's taken, um, just outside um, the carriage and wagon shed at Oxenhope. At, um, Oxenhope. Um, what I'm going to do is to tell you the story of its life. Um, it's 150 years old, not quite in the form that you see there, um, but tell the story of its life on the basis of photographs that have been collected from all over the place, from all sorts of people who've been very generous and kind in letting me have them. Um, the poorest ones that you're going to see are the ones I've taken myself. Um, but um, there are hopefully some that you'll find of interest. Um, to source the history of the vehicle, uh, I've used over the years a number of sources, um, but um, in particular, um, the late Frank Dean, who may be known to some of you for his um, videos um, that he did of um, uh, British Railways in the closing days up in North Yorkshire in particular. And he used to travel on this vehicle uh, as part of his job. Um, so he had many, many tales to tell me about um, what it was used for, who used it and where it used to go. There are though, again, as um, you'll see later on, a number of mysteries still about some aspects of its life. Um, information comes to light at all sorts of times and occasions. Previous talks have um, provided information to fill in one or two of the gaps. Um, perhaps that'll happen tonight, who knows? But anyway, that's, that's the vehicle as it is today, um, almost, as I'll explain at the very, very end. The story starts in 1868 when Parliament passed legislation requiring the railway companies, except the Metropolitan Railway, um, to provide separate smoking accommodation on all their passenger trains. So whereas today the move is to stop people smoking, in those days it was to encourage it. Um, and uh, as a result, all the railway companies, as I say, except the Met, um, had to provide smoking accommodation on their passenger trains. Um, and uh, in 1871, the Stockton and Darlington Railway um, built two um, smoking saloons, two four-wheel smoking saloons um, at their Darlington carriage works at Hopetown. Um, and they were numbered 221 and 222. The one we're interested in is this one, 221, uh, which you see there. Um, it had bench seats down the side, uh, spittoons in the floor and oil lamps. And it was used on the long distance route from what is now Teesside over the Pennines at Stainmore to Kirby Stephen, Appleby and onto the West Coast. Um, now the Stockton and Darlington had actually been taken over by the Northeastern Railway in 1863, um, but it still operated as a separate entity um, so I think I'm justified in claiming that this indeed um, is a Stockton and Darlington railway vehicle. Um, 
Now, in 1876, um, the Stockton and Darlington was formally absorbed by the Northeastern, and they took over this building, which was um, the Hopetown Carriage Works, where that saloon was actually built. Um, this is a photograph of it um, in not quite the best of condition, um, uh, but this is, this is the, the, the original carriage works for the Stockton and Darlington. When it first started, it actually bought in carriages and then it decided that it needed to start to build its own. And this is the building where it was done. Um, the Northeastern Locomotive Preservation Group occupies this end nearest to you, um, and the A1 Trust is in the other end, and that's after it had been refurbished uh, by Darlington Borough Council, who own it, um, and NELPG is on the right, A1 Trust on the left, and the centre there, the centre tower, um, you can see there's an archway and that is where the carriages used to come out. Um, in the middle of the tower there was um, a, a little turntable. The carriages were built in either end, came to the turntable, which then um, allowed them to come out of there. And the field which is in the front there is the old um, scrapping line at Darlington, um, where um, BR disposed of a large number of steam locomotives um, at the end of steam. The field is now the events field. It's used for all sorts of things. Nobody digs too deeply into the field because who knows what might lie underneath there um, in terms of um, bits and pieces, uh, some of which might be a bit nasty. But anyway, um, in the early 1880s, the Northeastern decided um, that the saloon, which had now been renumbered 1661 in the Northeastern Railway um, uh, numbering system, uh, would become the locomotive superintendent's inspection saloon. Now, I don't know precisely when that occurred, um, possibly during the time of Edward Fletcher, um, but essentially the four-wheeled vehicle was extended, put onto a six-wheeled underframe, and it was based at Gateshead, which is where this photograph was taken. Mm -hmm. The locomotive that's with it there is Aerolite, uh, number 66, which is now in the NRM, as we'll see later on. Uh, and that was specially allocated to haul the saloon. So whether it was Edward Fletcher or Archibald MacDonald, um, but certainly later on, the two Wurzel brothers, um, whether um, they um, had it, um, that was their special train, effectively. Uh, the locomotive superintendent's um, own means of getting around the system. Um, the photograph was taken roughly between 1892 and 1904, and it was allegedly at Gateshead. No one's been able to confirm it one way or the other. Uh, but you see there in front of it, standing uh, very much to attention, um, the steward uh, in the bowler hat, uh, who is believed to be a Mr. Collinson. And he was the personal attendant to Wilson Worsdall, which is why this is later than when the conversion first took place. And the driver is believed to be Mr. Craggs, um, who was the regular driver of the inspection train. Um, he's the one, I think, who is on the left because he's got a cap on. Uh, the fireman stands in the middle with a cloth cap rather than uh, a more formal peak cap. Um, another photograph of it, this time without 66, um, number 190. Um, don't know why, don't know where. Um, but we think it's Mr. Collinson still standing in the window there, um, but it's just another view of, of the saloon as it was at the turn of the century. Um, in 1888, gas lighting was introduced to replace oil in carriages. Whether the locomotive superintendent benefited from that, don't know. It might have gone straight to electric. Um, one of life's little mysteries. 1900, 
um, saw um, the Royal Train here leaving York um, on the 20th of June 1900, taking the Prince, later Edward VII, and the Princess of Wales from York, where he'd been at the Royal Agricultural Show, which in those days and up until quite recently used to travel around the country, um, to Newcastle, where he was going to lay the foundation stroke stone for the Royal Victoria Infirmary, which is the main hospital in Newcastle. Um, I've seen this photograph on many occasions. It's a well-known photograph. It's been published in all sorts of, of books. Um, but I hadn't really twigged the first vehicle behind the locomotive until somebody pointed it out to me and said that they thought it looked very familiar. And indeed, it is the saloon um, as part of the Royal Train um, behind the locomotive. Um, the question then is, um, why? Why on earth do you want to put the locomotive superintendent's inspection saloon at the front of the Royal Train? And the only explanation that has come to light is that the locomotive that you see there was brand new out of Darlington Works, literally um, only a few days before um, had it been turned out. And the thought is that they put the locomotive superintendent's saloon in there, um, <laughs> loaded up with um, the experts, um, so that if something went wrong, they were on hand to put it right extremely quickly. Um, so that's um, the saloon as part of a royal train going off to Newcastle with the Prince of Wales to um, as, as part of the unveiling of um, uh, the foundation stone that he was laying for the RVI. Um, and there is a photograph of Queen Victoria outside the hospital. Um, there's one of the official party. Um, the thing that amazes me about that is the number of people that are in the background there watching um, the royal party unveiling a foundation stone. Um, but anyway, obviously it was a very big event indeed. Um, and there's the foundation stone itself, um, confirming that it was on, um, on June 1900 that it was laid. Um, this is a photograph taken um, between 1902 and 1907. Um, again, don't know where, um, don't know precisely when, um, although the livery in which the locomotive um, is um, shown there um, would help to, has helped to pin it down a little bit. Um, uh, but the thought is that the vehicle behind it is indeed the saloon, um, judging from the little bit that you can see. And this is a photograph I picked up at um, a railway honor auction um, on one of the stands that was there. Um, and um, have been unable to um, find very much more out about it. Um, but it is an interesting photograph in the aerolite itself uh, is in a livery which is not um, uh, all that common. One day might find out where it, where it was taken and what, what the circumstances were. Um, we then get to 1904. And by this time, um, Wilson Wurzdal, who was the locomotive superintendent on the, on the Northeastern, decided that he was going to change his title and become the chief mechanical engineer. And as a result, he felt that his inspection saloon, which he used for traveling around, um, visiting engine sheds, railway facilities, and, and sit and meeting staff and so on, um, should be rebuilt to his design. Um, so you see it there, it was extended, uh, put onto an eight wheel bogey underframe, and it then provided him with a saloon which had individual armchairs and tables, um, a toilet compartment, you can see the frosted glass in the window there, um, a guards stewards compartment with a wine rack, a cool box, crockery cupboards, and a cupboard that was used to house the steps 
to enable him to get off and on the saloon at locations where there were no platforms. Because um, obviously, if, you, if you're visiting a motive power depot, uh, locomotive shed, um, no, there wouldn't necessarily be a platform there to enable him to get down. Um, so the, the, the steps were an important part of the, uh, uh, of the uh, facilities that were carried. Um, there was uh, a kitchen at the end with a gas cooker, hot and cold water, sink, cutlery drawers, every, everything that anybody would need to travel around and be self-sufficient. Um, and uh, this is inside, looking towards the kitchen end. So you can see here, um, settee at the far end, table, bench seats down the side and some individual chairs. And through the door on the right hand side of the um, settee is the passageway that leads to the toilet, which sits immediately behind the settee. Then you've got the guards compartment and then you've got the kitchen at the far end. Um, unfortunately, I haven't got any modern photographs showing the top here, um, but take it from me the, the what you see at the top in the clear story. Um, is exactly the same as it is in the vehicle today. Um, some of the rest has changed, but just remember that there's a clock there and remember that table as well. Looking the other way, you can see the bench seats running down, seats at the far end, table and so on. Um, uh, and obviously you get a good view from out of the windows. Uh, the official photograph was taken, locomotive and saloon. Uh, we think this is at Jarrow Slake on the Tyne, uh, which seems to have been used regularly for um, official photographs of all sorts of locomotives and other equipment. Um, and in the um, late in, in the 19 early 1920s, um, it was used. Um, I'm going to say strangely, but it was was used for. Um, braking trials or equipment, braking equipment trials. Uh, and this is part of a letter from uh, Vincent Raven, um, organized, giving the details of the organization that he'd laid on for the visitors coming up from um, uh, the South um, to uh, carry out the trials in which he had made his saloon available to them all. Uh, this is a photograph um, taken in 1925, and here it is leaving Darlington Station um, uh, on a trip out to somewhere. It was based at Darlington, um, and that's where, um, at that time, um, the uh, locomotive, well, the chief mechanical engineer uh, for the Northeastern was based. Of course, in 1923, um, uh, the um, LNER had been formed, the Northeastern disappeared, um, and um, the vehicle remained at Darlington, but it became the inspection saloon for the assistant chief mechanical engineer, chap called AC Stamer, um, and Aerolite continued, as you can see here, as its allocated locomotive. And this, of course, is Aerolite as it is today in, um, in the National Railway Museum. Um, now, in 1933, um, Mr. Stamer retired uh, on the 31st of December. Aerolite was withdrawn and went in, was re restored. I was going to not really restored in the common sense that we use it today, but was, was renovated and taken to um, the LNER's museum at Queen Street in York, and then ultimately came across to um, the National Royal Museum when that was established in, in York um, in 1975. And it's in there today. I was there a couple of weeks ago. Unfortunately, the um, information board has got a number of errors on it, but um, not to worry about that too much, but that is, is the locomotive. Um, and um, at that time, um, in, the in 19, 
33, when Mr. Stamer retired, Aerolite was withdrawn, the saloon was rebuilt yet again. Um, the main thing that happened were that these picture windows were put in, and you'll now recognize that 1934, um, the vehicle looks very much like the way um, it does today. Um, that was the main change that was, was made. Um, and you can see through the windows, you've got the saloon end on the right. You can see where the settee is. Uh, you then got the toilet compartment with the, with the white and glass. Then you've got the guards compartment with the door. And then you've got the kitchen at the far end. Um, it's an interesting photograph because um, the, the change, the, 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 the rebuild was carried out in 1934. But if you have a look on the sole bar, it says there, um, painted 12824. Um, now, that's not what you would have expected to see in a vehicle that was rebuilt in 1934. Um, also, when the LNER was established, um, the letter Y was put on the northeastern uh, vehicle numbers, which you see there, which again points to this being 1924 when this was when, when this change was made. But all the records and all the books and all the memories of everybody says no, it was withdrawn in 1934 with Aerolite, and this was rebuilt into the form that you see it there. Who knows who's right? But well, it's, it's another of those mysteries that one day um, we will uh, might get to the bottom of. But that's, that's how it looked in 1934. In 1952, it was seen at York um, in an LNER varnished teak livery. What happened in between times? Who knows? Um, bear in mind that 1952 BR had been formed in 1947, but here's the vehicle with a BR number 902179, um, but uh, with LNER still proudly showing on the bodywork. Uh, this was one of a series of photographs that was taken by the late Ken Hool, um, and um, uh, it was uh, taken at, at York because by this time, the vehicle had moved from uh, Darlington. Uh, it had, um, uh, with the creation of British Railways, uh, been moved to York and became the inspection saloon for the general manager of the Northeastern region of BR. Um, and it continued until a subsequent general manager brought his own Great Eastern saloon from Liverpool Street. Um, which brings it down into your territory. Um, so this vehicle then became uh, surplus to requirements as far as the general manager was concerned. Um, and it became the inspection saloon for the signal and telegraph engineer at York, which is where Frank Dean comes in because he was one of the staff um, who used to travel out um, in the vehicle under that uh, regime. And in the early 50s, it was used for all sorts of things. Um, Frank told me of um, the times when um, on a bright sunny day in York, um, they might gather all the papers together off the desks and decide to go out to Scarborough um, and, and carry out an inspection of um, one of the signals on the end of Scarborough station. Um, I gather that that signal was inspected very, very frequently on sunny days. Um, but um, anyway, um, it was also used for tours of inspection by the judges in the station best kept gardens competition in the Northeastern region, for example. Um, so um, it appeared um, subsequently in 1960. This is a photograph taken from uh, Frank Hicks book um, that was my railway from Plowman's Kid to Railway Boss. And again, another interesting little piece here. Um, the vehicle, the saloon, is still in that livery, LNER 
902179. The locomotive is claimed to be J19 65042. Um, according to the records, um, bear in mind this was photographed in 1960, according to the records, 65042 was a J21, and it was withdrawn in July 1954. Um, so what was the locomotive and where was it this photograph taken because the book gives no indication. Um, it's impossible from the quality of the photograph to work out, even magnifying it, what the number is, other than it does definitely start 6.5, um, but the rest of the number is, is, is unreadable, unfortunately. Um, having shown this to colleagues in the Northeastern Railway Association, the general view was that this was a photograph that was taken at Filey Holiday Camp, um, and presumably um, uh, Frank Hick was out um, on a visit, an inspection visit to the Holiday Camp station. It used to get around quite a lot in the 60s. This is when some more of the photographs turn up. Um, this is um, again at York Station, about to depart off to Castle Eden, um, saloon with um, 264 tank, which is now on the lakeside in Haverthwaite. Um, and there's a picture of it actually leaving the station. And you can see um, the signal and telegraph department in force, um, sat in, um, ready to travel out for the day. Um, it was spotted in 1961 at Newcastle Central Station, um, pretending to be a parcels van um, in, a, in, a, in the middle of a freight. Heaven knows what was going on, but you can see the parcels there in the window, whether they're on the table or whether they're stacked up on, on chairs, who knows, not at all sure. Um, and then um, it was, uh, seen here passing through Harryholme Junction, just south of Darlington, behind B1 Ralph Asherton. Whoops, sorry, what on earth is happening here? Let me whiz forward again. There we are, that's Ralph Asherton at Harryholme Junction. Don't know what's going on. Um, this is at Morpeth. By now, it had become uh, part of the BR Eastern Northeastern region um, uh, stock in BR Maroon, um, renumbered with E on the end, um, standing in the bay platform at Morpeth. Um, and um, again, you know, not clear why it had ended up there, um, obviously with a mineral wagon next to it. Um, and um, who knows what was what was going on. Um, seen here on the Scarborough line, so it was getting around. Um, uh, seen at Robin Hood's Bay uh, behind 61319. Um, and in 65, um, again, same locomotive, um, leaving York Station northbound. Um, for somewhere, who knows where. But it wasn't only traveling around the northeastern region. Um, here's a photograph taken uh, at Ludenfoot Troughs in West Yorkshire. Um, same sort of um, activity. You can see the staff traveling out in style um, on their inspection visit. It wasn't only steam, however, that um, has hauled the vehicle. Um, here it is in York Station, waiting for everybody to turn up um, behind um, D5176. Um, here it is at Jervo on the Wensleydale branch, and then passing Kildale on the Esk Valley branch between Middlesbrough and Whitby. Um, so that takes us through the 60s. It was, was used um, uh, sporadically all around the network in the northeast of England. Um, in 1969, it was deemed surplus to requirements. 
and it was withdrawn from service and it was purchased from BR by this gentleman, John Dawson. Uh, this is the only photograph I've got of John with the saloon. Uh, this was actually taken at Pickering um, some many years later. Um, but it, as I say, it's the only one I've got of John. Uh, he bought it from um, BR. Uh, he used to work for, for BR. Um, there was a tale that it was his, his gold watch, um, but I know that he actually purchased it and I know how much he purchased it for. Um, but he had a choice. Uh, there was a saloon shed at York because there was more than, than this saloon. All the senior officers, not just Signal and Telegraph, but um, Permanent Way and so on, all had their own saloons. And he had a choice um, of one of four that were in the saloon shed at the time. Um, all were preserved in the end, bought by various individuals. Um, but John bought this one and it was taken to the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway in West Yorkshire, uh, with which he had been associated for some time. And of course, when it was there in 1970, um, it was used in the Railway Children film as the Old Gentleman Saloon, which is the way in which it is now known um regardless of its its history um it's always known as the old gent saloon um and people are very surprised to hear that before the railway children film actually this was a working railway vehicle um for nearly 100 years that's william mervyn um at leisure smoking a cigarette now something which is banned um, but um, obviously uh, enjoying himself. He was um, the old gentleman in the film. Diana Sheridan was the mother. Bernard Cribbins, the famous Mr. Perks. Um, Jenny Agatha, Sally Thompson and Gary Warren played the children. Um, now you can see here, it looks as if it's, it, it, it's in, in wood. You've seen it previously running around on BR in the 60s in its maroon livery. Um, the film company did not um, strip all the paint off and varnish it. Um, they painted over it, and this is scumbled uh, wood-like paint, um, which was, was done for the filming. Um, so don't for one minute ever, ever believe anybody who tells you that it was, was stripped down and revarnished. Um, a few photographs of, of the Railway Children film. Um, this is um, the old gentleman's train um, uh, approaching Haworth. Um, looking out for the children, the old gentleman. Um, the guard there was Graham Mitchell, who was um, the chairman of the Keithley and Worth Valley Railway at the time. Um, and you can see there, Great Northern and Southern Railway, um, the... Uh, uh, false railway company that uh, the railway children film people created. Um, here it is past the crossing um, Mythome's um, viaduct, um, heading for the tunnel. In the early days of the Worth Valley Railway, actually, um, this this is this is really a deviation. There used to be a viaduct that runs roughly where the the uh, smoke is coming out the chimney, um, which ran across here and round the back of what is now the tunnel. Um, so this is, this is running on effectively a deviation. Um, passing the site of the landslip. And remember in those days, there was none of this computer generated stuff. Um, the landslip was, was a physical landslip. Um, they had one go at getting it right if it, if it all went wrong, that was it. Um, but that's the site of where it was. Um, and they um, put up that, um, those, those, um, that fence, I suppose you'd call it, um, to protect the railway while uh, the trains were running. And then between Haworth and um, Oxenhope, um, and you'll see there, health and safety was not something which was a priority at the time. Uh, you can see the film crew on the cab of the locomotive um, I don't know what would, well, I do know what would be said about trying to do that these days without any safety arrangements whatsoever. Um, so um, that was 
its time um, during the filming, um, when it wasn't being used, it was parked in the yard at Haworth. And there you see on the left, the Pullman car, which was used as the dressing room for the actors, then the saloon, then you've got the Green Dragon, um, the um, Lancashire and Yorkshire 060, which is about to re-enter traffic after a major overhaul and will be coming out in that livery for the Railway Children's 50th anniversary, um, a year late, like many other things, um, over the August Bank holiday weekend. Um, some interesting vehicles as well. Um, people often comment on uh, the vintage cars that are in the foreground there. The railway, of course, had um, enormous publicity from the film. And as a result, um, they had to put a passing loop in here at Demens um, because um, the demand uh, was such that the line couldn't cope as a single line operation. So they put the loop in to split the line and enable them to run two trains um, simultaneously. Um, this is the site. This photograph is taken just about from where the signal box now is for anyone who knows the Worth Valley. Um, but there was, as I say, tremendous response. Um, the railway it was overwhelmed with, with people um, coming to see it as a result of the film being made there. So that was the Railway Children film, which um, created um, the aura about the vehicle. Um, and it was taken up to a major exhibition in 1972 um, as part of the Newcastle Festival. Um, and it was um, uh, on display here um, for a week and was seen um, by over 13,000 people um, visited the exhibition. Um, and I spent a whole week um, up there with it um, at, uh, uh, looking after various bits and pieces. Um, the mid 70s, of course, saw the 150th anniversary of the Stockton and Darlington Railway. And um, not surprisingly, um, as a Stockton and Darlington Railway vehicle, and probably the only one that was actually still operational, um, it was invited to go there. Uh, by this time, um, five years on uh, from when it had been in the Railway Children film, um, the paintwork was beginning to look a bit rough, um, was beginning to peel off um, and looking very tatty. And John Dawson wanted to put it through Doncaster Works um, to have the paintwork sorted out and also to have one or two minor mechanical things seen to. He had retired, as, as I said, when he, when he purchased it in 69, he'd retired. Um, he couldn't um, afford himself to fund um, the work that was necessary, but was very anxious to get the vehicle to children for the uh, commemoration. Um, and he therefore advertised for people to put some money in to help fund um, the overhaul although that's perhaps too grand a word for it. I suppose it was an early form of crowdfunding, um, although in this case, only two people um, responded. I was one of them. And um, Ted Watkinson, um, who um, lived down in the Midlands, um, uh, but was very much associated with the Strathspey. And for those of you who follow these things, um, he owned the Black 5, 5025, um, which has just literally uh, returned to service after a major overhaul, which has taken, I've lost track, I think about 20 years to actually complete. Um, but he also had um, a whole range of um, Scottish vehicles, Highland Railway and other things. So he was very, very much um, into railway preservation in those days. And we both put in um, what today um, 
probably the amount that you spend on your groceries every week. Um, but we put a small amount of money in each to um, supplement John and the vehicle became essentially, um, I suppose, a, a kind of partnership where um, we all were given shares equivalent to the amount of money that we put in. John clearly had the major holding um, and Ted and I had, had the minor one. Um, but it made no difference in that it was always known as John Dawson's Saloon and still is in certain quarters to this day. So as a result, it went through Darlington Works um, and um, appeared at the exhibition at Shildon in 1975. And this, again, is the only photograph I've got of it there, and it's on the left. It's an accidental photograph because the photographer was actually taking a photograph of the Danish locomotive in the foreground, but happened to capture the saloon. Um, and uh, as you can see, it was available for people to go and have a look round uh, from the outside um, at, at, at the vehicle. Um, there may be other photographs of it out there somewhere, but no one has as yet come forward. Um, when the exhibition was finished, it went off to the main hall of the NRM, which was opened by the Duke of Edinburgh in September 1975, um, before it went back to the Keith Lee and Worth Valley, um, which is its home. A year later, it was out again. And in 1976, um, it was the centenary of the Settle in Carlisle. And to mark the occasion, this rather magnificent collection of vehicles um, did a trip over the SNC uh, with Hardwick, uh, with Scotsman, um, with the saloon as the second vehicle in the consist, which was made up of a large number of vintage carriages. Uh, John travelled on this, um, and um, uh, I'm told that uh, he used to regularly sleep overnight on the settee. Um, I don't think he will have done it on this occasion, though, um, because this was, this was really a very special event. The next move away from the Worth Valley uh, was the year after that, in 1977. Uh, some of you may have heard of the Derwent Valley Light Railway. Um, it was a line which ran from York um, out to the... Ooh, I get my um, compass wrong here. Um, but it ran out into the East Yorkshire countryside through Dunnington, uh, Wheeldrake and various others. It was very much an agricultural line. Uh, it uh, escaped um, the LNER and it escaped BR nationalisation as well. Um, and it was essentially a goods line. It uh, carried grain in particular uh, from, from East Yorkshire into York um, and various other agricultural goods. But in 1977, um, they decided to open it up for passenger traffic. And um, for that, they hired in um, the J72, uh, Joe M 69023, uh, which had been bought by Ron Ainsworth from BR in 1967, and again had gone to the Keith Lynn Worth Valley Railway. Um, and they also hired in the saloon. And here is a photograph of the official launch of the service um, back in 1977 um, with the Lord Mayor of York um, standing on the footplate. Um, and he was genuinely on the footplate as he was a BR driver. So he actually knew what he was doing. Um, but that's the rest of the party. Um, Arthur Todd, who is the guard there, looking very severe, um, was um, a well-known uh, gentleman on the railway uh, with a fearsome reputation. You crossed him at your peril. Um, so that's, that's the official opening. 
Um, that gives you an indication of the sort of line that we're talking about. That's your minster in the background. Um, and that, that is the line. It was like that all the way out um, to um, Dunnington uh, and beyond. Um, you can see again that um, people weren't too fussed about health and safety with people walking on the line. Um, unfortunately, the line did not survive um, and um, neither did the passenger service. It, it lasted 1977 and 78 and then ended. The line's been taken up. It's now um, a footpath um, and cycleway. So if David ever comes up to the northeast, um, that's uh, one of those um, old railway lines that he can um, travel on um, and explore on his bike. Um, so um, that essentially then saw it back on the um, Worth Valley. Um, and its next move was to the North Yorkshire Moors Railway. Um, and it spent the summer of 1991 there, um, reunited with Joe M, which was now owned by the Northeastern Locomotive Preservation Group. And um, the saloon was uh, taken over um, because um, I'm an NALPG member as well, um, to help uh, mark the 25th anniversary of the group. And here it is passing Gromont MPD um, with Joe M, um, and we used it for um, carrying VIPs and uh, various others uh, on special trips up and down the line. Now, there it is at Pickering. Um, in the days before the overall roof was put back, that's how Pickering Station used to be in the early days of the NYMR. Um, and then um, uh, by the time we got to um, 1994, um, uh, the varnish um, and the general external condition of the vehicle uh, meant that some remedial work was required. Um, by this time, I had become the sole owner of the saloon. Um, John Dawson um, found that his, he, he was looking to supplement his pension. And so we agreed a deal where um, uh, I paid him so much a month and essentially bought out his shares in the saloon. Um, I suppose it's a kind of higher purchase because there was no way I was going to be able to afford to buy the whole lot in a lump sum. Um, and um, Ted Watkinson in the meantime had died um, and I had acquired his share from the executors of his estate. Um, so as I say, by 1994, um, I'd become the sole own owner, but it made no difference in terms of representation because um, it was very much known as John's saloon, John Dawson's saloon, and it remained that way, um, even though there was only one change in the initial letter of our names. Um, 1996, as I say, um, this is Len Clark, who might again be known to some of you, um, he was um, a well-known um, railway vehicle painter. Um, I, I knew him extremely well and known him for a long time. Again, no longer with us, um, but he revarnished the saloon and taught me a lot about um, how to carry that out. In fact, in terms of maintenance, um, it's been until quite recently, it's been fairly minimal. Revarnishing is, is going on there. Um, the roof started to leak, so um, we had to strip the canvas off um, and clean it all up. Um, in doing so, we revealed um, traces of the original lining on the clerestory. Um, and the worst job of all, which was applying the canvas seal, um, which was a kind of gunge that you put on, and then the canvas is put on top of that. And um, the theory is that you put the canvas and press it in 
so that it impregnates the canvas structure um, and makes um, a weatherproof seal. Um, and the finished job um, looked like that. The colour is not authentic, um, but it was what was available at the time and therefore was used. Um, other bits and pieces we needed to do was replace the footboard, um, the underframe pipe work had asbestos tape around it, so that got us into the asbestos world. Um, that is the back of the oven and cooker um, with a metal plate there with asbestos sheets behind it. Um, that is the sort of thing that you don't actually disturb at all. You leave that, it's encapsulated, it's safe, it's not going to cause a problem. Um, but of course, in those days, that was the way in which you insulated and stopped the heat, heat spreading. Um, but for um, the underframe pipe work and one or two other things, to get them off, we had to get specialist contractors in to remove the asbestos, um, uh, which was um, not an easy job to do, nor was it particularly cheap. But anyway, it had to be done. Um, we've had to replace, and I talk about it as we, because um, carriage and wagon at, um, at, at Keithley were part of um, the process, so it was a, a, a joint effort. Now we had to replace some of the missing lampshades, um, which was not an easy job. And I have to say that I found somebody in Essex who was able to produce those. Um, and I've got two spares still, just in case something else happens. Um, the brake blocks had to be replaced when they were worn, because um, those were BR and not LNER pattern ones. And nowadays, ultrasonic tests of the axles to make sure that everything was OK for operation. Um, and then in 1996, at the end of the year, um, it was used for a special train. That's Dinah Sheridan, who came to visit the railway and to present it with an award um, for tourism and its activities in the tourist world. Um, and uh, with them is Gray Mitchell, who you recognize from the earlier railway children photographs. Um, and that's Nigel Ward, who was playing the old gentleman on this particular occasion. So again, in use on the railway for um, special occasions. And then I will conclude for a short break, David, if that's all right, um, with the news that in 1999, uh, John Dawson sadly passed away um, at the age of 88. Um, and his funeral, he lived up in uh, Weardale, and his funeral was held at the end of that year at Eastgate Parish Church. Um, so at that time, I then really became um, on my own and the sole owner of the vehicle. Um, and I'll stop there for five, ten minutes, David. Yeah, I think five minutes should, should, should be enough. OK. OK, so, I'll stop. I'll, I'll pause the recording. Fine. Thank I'll, you so very stop. Much. I'll tell you what, do you want to um, sort of uh, dis disconnect the picture and we'll, we'll stop, we'll, we'll stop.